Welcome to Emotional Resilience, Living with the Fruit of the Spirit. I'm your host and author, Ron Ovid. Today we're on Lesson 48. We're almost done with the year, and I really appreciate you sticking with us. I hope you've been able to really go back and look over some of the notes and, and you know, continue to keep up and, uh, with the program. And today we're in Lesson 48. We're in a series now, our last series on emotional relearning. We've talked about emotional recognition, right? And that's where we recognize that, you know, our emotions are out of, out of proportion to the event. We're over emoting. Maybe we're under emoting in a sense. Uh, then, then we want to regulate it. We want to be able to regulate our emotions, bring the prefrontal cortex back online. And then eventually what we want to do is emotionally relearn. What is it that is keeping us uh, feeling that way, the negative uh, feelings that we have, the emotions. And today we're going to get into that a little more. Uh, last time we talked about how do we learn? You know, how do we learn? How do we emotionally uh, relearn? And today we're going to continue on that line. You know, in order to uh, overcome a negative emotional learning, we must start by deconstructing the negative self-beliefs. You know, it's one thing to have a thought. It's another thing to agree with it. <laughs> you know, we have 60,000 thoughts a day and, uh, you know, we can't help what thoughts come into our mind, but we don't have to agree with them. Uh, we can have a negative thought and say, you know, that's just not true. We can deconstruct the thought and that's what we're going to spend time talking about today. Uh, deconstructing the belief and then we have to rehearse over and over again because of the way that we thought for so many years uh, we have to take a, when when the thought comes we dismiss it and soon soon our brain understands that we don't have to pay attention to it at all but it will take practice right and you know if someone offered you poison uh, you wouldn't take it You'd refuse it. Oh, here, here's some food. Fine. Oh, and by the way, here's a cup of poison. <laughs> I mean, it'd be foolish, right? I mean, you're not going to take it. And yet we take these poisonous thoughts and we agree with them and we take them in. And, we, and today what I'm hoping is that we'll be able to understand how we can understand that some of these thoughts that we've agreed with are really erroneous. They're wrong and we need to start dismissing them. You know, two lessons ago, we looked at a progression of negative emotional beliefs that lead to this, you know, fight, flight, freeze alarm. And, and it started with an emotional experience. There was an experience that happened, uh, whether we were humiliated or disrespected, we were bullied, whatever. You know, I gave you a whole list there, and it caused in us a reaction. But it's very important to understand something else happened the brain realized that, hey, this was dangerous, this was wrong, and the amygdala primed itself to remember certain things. It remembered the sensations. Perhaps it was the tone of voice, the look on the face, the body posture, uh, the body language, all kinds of things, uh, the cues that will remind us next time to be alert, to be on guard. We don't want that to happen again. But with the emotional experience, though, comes then a cascade of beliefs. You know, when, we, when, we, you know, when we've been humiliated, what does that say about us? What does that say about us? Maybe it says, I don't deserve love, or I'm worthless, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough. It isn't always followed with those words. At first, it's a feeling, it's a felt belief. But over time, it becomes a construct, a trait, right? A way that we think. And, you know, the amygdala now is sensitive to it. Uh, these lies, you know, uh, created, you know, are, are there because of the initial response. And so when we have the cues that come up and next time we see that kind of look or, or you know, we're going to be, you know, we got the look and, and all of a sudden we know, uh oh, I'm going to be humiliated. You know, we react. We react. There's a consequence to when I feel worthless. There's a consequence to when I get that look and I feel unlovable. All of a sudden, the consequence is I'll be rejected, I'll be humiliated, I'll be abandoned. You see how that's similar to the original experience? And, and we shy away from that, and so we see the cues, and before it happens, we're already reacting. We're already reacting. 
and, and, it, and we're reinforcing that negative belief. I'm not good enough. Um, I don't deserve love. I'm broken. And then it causes an emotional alarm. Because when we see that, when we remember, uh, you know, here comes the cues, right? All of a sudden, you know, we're thinking, oh boy, humiliation, you know, disrespected, all that's coming. Well, then, you know, that causes in us a, a larger, a larger problem. And that larger problem is, where is, what's the consequences of being broken? What's the consequences of not deserving love? What's the consequences of being rejected? Well, to a child, it's, it's, it's death. I mean, you know, and that's where the genesis is. It isn't a mature person it is, that's thinking these things that, that came up with them. It was a child that experienced it. And that can be adolescence as well. That experiences and, and, and their thought is, whether they're thinking or not, their body reacts, you know, and so what do we have here? The emotional, and I'm going to die. And, you know, I've worked with lots of people, and I teach it in the class a lot, and you've heard it. Uh, and I have a, a person came to me the other day and says, you know, I, I keep that right in my, uh, in my truck there when I'm, you know, and I have an emotional thing. All of a sudden, you know, I'm not going to die, <laughs> you know, and it shuts that down. It shuts it down. When we see how ludicrous, how ridiculous, I'm not going to die if the person doesn't like me. You know, I can make amends if I have to. I'm not going to die if I lose my job. You know, I mean, these things feel catastrophic, but we need to put them into the proper perspective. That's what we need to do. And so that negative cascade, if you will, of beliefs can be crippling. And, you know, you can see we're changing a lie in any one of those things. You know, I'm not broken. You can see we're changing that can change everything. I'm not going to die. You can see where that can change everything. And so when we approach those lies, when we approach those lies, we can start to change a lot of what's going on with us. And so we want to change our thinking, our belief system. And the question becomes, how do I change the deep-rooted habitual thinking? Because a lot of these things are habits. They're habits. I remember that book years ago, decades ago, Happiness is a Choice, and I was in the midst of my anxiety. And I remember taking that book and I reading, reading about it. And yes, the book helped me, but what really helped me was the title. Because I remember in reflection one day there, while I was reflecting and thinking and meditating, all of a sudden it was as if God was saying it to me, you know, if happiness is your choice, maybe anxiety is. And I started to own my belief systems. I started to own my emotions and saying, well, maybe some of these are habitual. And maybe I do have a choice. And we do. We do. And, and so we want to use uh, three different systems in emotional relearning. One is the deliberate questions, and that's what we're going to talk about today, belief exchange. Second is using scriptures and resources found, uh, you know, found in the Bible and, and with the use of the Holy Spirit and Christ, right? And we'll talk somewhat about that today as well. And then, you know, lessons, two lessons that are uh, next, we'll finish up talking about emotional relearning. How does this system really work? Memory reconsolidation. That's where we're going to end up. How do we rethink through our memories? Well, you know, one way to bring about change now is to flip the script. <laughs> you know, flip the script, the belief exchange. And we want to really start exchanging exchanging the lie for the truth. And we do that by using deliberate questions, deliberate questions. The power of this is when you arrive to the truth yourself. You see, it's one thing for me to tell you the truth, and, and that will help, but you're the one that has to believe it. And when you find the truth yourself for yourself, it really makes a difference. Have you ever done that? Where you're looking and you're looking and finally you have that aha, it sticks, it's exciting. And that's what we want to start to see. Our eyes are open to the truth about how lovable we really are, how created by God and in His sight we're whole, we're not broken. And when we realize these things, it changes our lives. And then what we need to do is repeat it over and over again. 
We need to learn it. Learning is a process. It's not just the aha is important and that can stick, but then we need to use it every time, right? And create a new neuronal pathway. Well, one way that I learned to do this is called cognitive processing therapy. I was trained in cognitive processing therapy. It works a lot with uh, uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress. And it, it really works with what they call stuck points, where we're stuck emotionally with this belief. And we challenge that belief where we can become unstuck. And cognitive processing therapy, it's an evidence-based uh, approach uh, to PTSD therapy. And uh, it, it has some great tenets. And I want to share some of that today where we can use some of those tenets for our own self, for those beliefs that we're stuck in. Ask yourself, what beliefs, you know, what am I believing that's keeping me stuck? Take some time and write that down. And, and I encourage you to get the notes here. If you don't have the notes, you know, it's going to be impossible for you to remember all this. So I encourage you to write me at ron at empowerministry.org. That's ron at empowerministry.org. And ask me for the notes, Lesson 48, and I'll be happy to send them to you. You know, we were taught in CPT to use critical questions to help a person overcome those emotional negative beliefs. And um, a lot of times it was the answer to why. Why? Why did this happen? You know, I've had an incident. I tell myself something usually in a you know, way of explaining why, usually blaming myself or something else. And consequently, I feel something. Maybe it's guilt or confusion or anger, uh, disgust. You know, I'm scared. In order then to emotionally relearn, we need to know what we're thinking in the first place. And so they've come up with what they call an emotional incident report. And it's really a, a good little thing, and I've put it in here for you. And you can go back, look at some of the lies, right, that we, you know, it's in the first page here. You can go back and look at those lies, what you're believing about yourself that isn't true. And you can ask yourself, when did I first believe this? When did it start happening? And maybe something will come to your mind. And if so, write it down. Write it down. And then you can go and ask yourself, what's the incident? Two, what am I telling myself about in terms of my involvement? And, you know, some samples would be, it was my fault. I was attacked. I am no good. That is why my father didn't come back. I'm ugly, so no one will ever love me. Or God abandoned me. He doesn't care. You know, those could have been some of the kinds of thoughts that happened. And then what do I feel as a result of what I'm telling myself? And four, is it reasonable to think what I'm thinking? Is it reasonable? And, you know, go back to question number two there. What am I, what am I believing, right? Is that reasonable? And then five, what would be a more logical response that a non-biased observer would have? Or you could ask it this way, what would I tell someone else? What would my more mature self say to someone else that I love if they were coming to me with that same thing? What would I tell them? And, you know, and that's number six. What can I tell myself then the next time this comes up? And so, you know, as you consider some of the negative beliefs that we've uncovered, right? Ask yourself these. Go back. Think of a Genesis moment, you know, early on where you believe that. Recapture that moment in your mind and then go through the emotional incident report. And what we want to do is learn to question these problematic beliefs. We want to look for uh, the thought. And when we learn what it is, we want to become our own observer. And we want to become more objective, as if we're listening to someone else. And, and we, what would we ask them, right? And so there's a series of questions that they have, 10 questions here. And I want to go through those real quickly. You know, first of all, there's the belief. What are we believing? You know, write them down. What are we believing? Then ask ourselves, what's the evidence? What's the evidence for and against this belief? And you'll hear this over and over again as we're talking about emotional relearning. You need to be your own lawyer. You need to be your own lawyer. You got to present your case to your own internal judge. You got to present the case. You need to be your own detective. Look for evidence, you know, 
innocent until proven guilty. We're already feeling guilty, right? We need to go against that. You're, you're the lawyer for the defense. You've got to go in there and say, no, not guilty. And you present your evidence. What's the evidence for and against this belief? And, you know, um, evidence consists of the type of facts that will hold up in court. We're not challenging that the event happened. We're looking for evidence that supports or does not support the belief that we have as a result of that. And, you know, remember in geometry, right, when you're trying to prove a theorem, it only takes one example to disprove it. <laughs> and a lot of times we need to know that. You know, we're, we're looking, you know, when we find out from one angle, we look at it and said it's not true, then it's not true. It's not true. Second, is your belief a habit or facts? You know, have you been telling yourself this so long that it feels true? You know, that's what advertising does. They wear you down. They keep telling you need this. You need this. You need this. And pretty soon, you know, we feel we need this, right? They wear you down. Well, that's what we do. That's what we do. It becomes a habit, a well-worn habit. And, you know, habits can change. You know, you have a choice. You have a choice. And in three, in what ways is your belief not included in all, uh, includes all the information? Are you looking at just one thing or have you looked at all the facts? You know, are you just using circumstantial evidence instead of looking at everything? It's possible your belief is unrealistic and not wholly accurate, not entirely true. And then four, does it include all or nothing terms? You know, are you looking at black and white here thinking? You know, is it all good or all bad? Are you missing some of the things in between? You know, uh, and so we need to look at that. Does your belief include words or phrases that are extreme or exaggerated? And so they carry an emotion with it. And so, you know, always or never or, I, you know, I should, I must, I can't. You know, words that just end it. You know, words that say, that's it, it's final, that's my final answer, right? <laughs> well, maybe it's not the final answer. And then in number six, in what ways is your belief focused on just one piece of the story? Maybe you're just looking at one piece of the story over and over again, and it's exaggerated and pulled out of context. You know, uh, the question is about deciding one piece of information from the event that caused the event to happen. Uh, they use an example in class of a guy that was in a, a car accident. He was at a light, the light turned green, he waited, no cars, he went through. But a car came out of a parking lot, speeding, went through the light, crashed into him. His sister was in the car, hit him, broadsided him, and she died. She snapped, you know, her neck and she died. He was okay, but for five years he's been suffering emotionally. And, and no one could figure out why. I mean, yes, it was tragic, it was wrong, but he's feeling all this guilt. The police told him there's nothing he could have done. Nothing. Nothing he could have done. And yet, under investigating, looking at this, when you looked at the piece of the story, what piece was he looking at? The piece he was looking at is as he went across, he wanted to change the channel because a certain song was on he wanted. And he went down like this to push, you know, to twist the dial or whatever, and bam! And all those years, he's carrying the weight of the guilt that it's because he was looking at the radio instead of the oncoming car from the side. It, it, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't have made one difference. There's nothing he could have done that looking down did not have it. And it, it took some time to change his mind. Logically, he got it. And it took some time for his emotions to catch up because it was such an habitual thought. But when he looked at all the evidence, he saw that there's nothing he could have done. He can be sad about the event, horribly sad about his sister dying, but not carry the guilt that it was his fault. Well, the other thing is, where did this belief come from? Is it a dispendable source of belief? Well, under more investigation, the parents were all upset, right? And, and mother did say to him one time, you know, oh, if you would have just been more careful. Well, she didn't know the circumstances. She was a grieving mother. That was early on. But that son heard that 
and he didn't forget it. He, he knew better probably, but it stuck with him. Well, that together with the radio causes belief. Now, under examination, years later, he can look back and say, no, my mother doesn't believe that now. She knows. She was just being emotional. Anyone would have been emotional. It was just a cry of despair. There was no real truth in it, and mother knows that. And he was able to know that. You know, you, we have to remember some of these events, right? Uh, you know, when we, you know, we look on one piece of story, we forget some of the others. You know, we're looking at one little slice. For example, uh, you know, the blame, and you're discounting other factors. You know, it was my fault that I got, you know, I got beat up. You know, I was, you know, I should have been stronger and it wouldn't have happened. Well, the other slices might be uh, the fact that you were outnumbered. Yeah, that might have made a difference. Or maybe the perpetrator had a weapon. Hello. How about you were taken by surprise? I mean, all those things add into that. You see, when we look at one thing, when we look at the radio, well, how about the person came, you know, out of the parking lot, speeding, drag racing? Didn't that have something to do with it? How about the fact that you waited long enough, you had a solid green light? Didn't that have something to do with it? And so then you look too, like we said, at the, where did the belief come from? Where did it come from? You know, did it come from a 20-year-old that was scared in combat? You know, did it come from a, a very young child that knew no difference? You know, where did it come from? Was it someone that was in an emotional state, you know, highly emotional and really wasn't thinking logically? And then, you know, are, uh, how is your belief confusing something that's possible with something that is likely? You know, when we start looking at possibilities, you know, theory, I'm telling you, anything is possible. The question is, is it probable? And a lot of times our beliefs are based on possibility. If I go there, it's going to happen. No, no, who says that? What's the probability? And we need to look at that. And number nine, in what ways is your belief based on feelings rather than fact? You know, uh, is it true? You know, if it feels true, it must be true. That's not necessarily true. If you feel guilty, it doesn't mean you're necessarily guilty. You know, there is such a thing as false guilt, right? And so, you know, you know if you're uncomfortable in a crowd, you know, and you feel uncomfortable in that, that doesn't mean there is danger. It means you feel like there's danger. And so we need to ask ourselves, is this feeling or is it fact? Number 10, in what ways is this belief focused on unrelated parts of this story? You know, I, I uh, you know, wore a black coat and I was assaulted. Therefore, if I wear a black coat again, you know, that's just superstition. That's how strong associations are. And we can go from an instance that was highly emotional and, and create associations that aren't true. I often use the example of a gambler. He's pulling all day on the the lever there to get the money out, nothing happens. He, he goes like this, you know, then he pulls the lever, ching, 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 ching. What do you think he's going to do the next time? Puts a quarter and he's going to go like this. It will probably take him seven, eight, nine, ten times before he stops doing that. That's how strong associations are. And we can make all kinds of false associations when we have trauma. And we need to examine these things. Let me give you an example. Here's a belief. My father left me and my mother because I was ugly and unlovable. A young woman came and said that, right? I should have been prettier and smarter than he would have loved me. Well, what's the evidence for that? Well, my father never hugged me or said that he loved me, and then he left. It was because I was ugly and unlovable. He didn't want me. That's what she thought. What's against that belief? Well, my father was a grown man and made his own decisions. He did not respond to me with love because that's the choice he made. I have many friends who do not feel I'm physically repulsive or unlovable. Well, how about number two? Is it a belief? Is it a habit or fact? It's a habit. I've been blaming myself for years. I, was, I wasn't considering other facts. I guess it was just a habit. How about three? In what ways is your belief not including all the information? I wasn't taking in account my mother's love or my siblings' love for me and how and my friends in school and how acceptable to them I was. Well, 
How about uh, does number four, does your belief include all or none terms, all or nothing? Well, it was an immature belief. I never argued against it and presented arguments to the contrary. I did not consider that it could have been my father's problem and not mine. Well, number five, does the belief include words like or phrases that are extreme or exaggerated? Well, yes, I should have been prettier and smarted, smarter than he would have loved me. Well, that was false. That's er erroneous. Six, in what ways is your belief focused on one piece? I focused on the fact that he never demonstrated affection toward me and assumed that I was the cause of his leaving. Seven. Where did the belief come from? Is it a dependable source? Well, the belief came from me. I was a young child, and when he first left, my mother was frustrated and said, if I had been better, Dad would not have left. Well, that was wrong. And number eight, how is your belief confusing something that is possible with something that's likely? Well, I kept thinking my dad would not have left if I could have been different. Maybe I could have done something, but it isn't likely. My father is the one that wasn't meeting my needs. He's the one who chose to leave. My looks and lovability had nothing to do with it. In nine, how is it based on feelings rather than facts? Because I felt guilty. I thought it must be my fault. The fact is my dad had his own issues and left because he couldn't handle the responsibilities and had problems with my mother. And then in what ways is this belief focused on unrelated parts of the story? Well, I was focused completely on his leaving and not feeling a lot of love from him. My conclusion was there's something wrong with me. And so she was able to conclude after all that, that I have a husband and children who love me. I have my mother, sibling, and friends who feel I'm good enough. My father left because of his own issues, and I had very little to do with it. Now, that's what we need to be doing. And I encourage you, get the notes and, and follow this and start working on your own lives. And then use the Word of God. That's the second thing we're talking about. We'll talk about this more in the next lessons. Use the Word of God in the battle for our mind, right? Uh, you know, ask God for awareness when you're reading the Scriptures. I have a, a book called Overcoming the Lies We Believe or Feel Are True, and I encourage you to write me at ron at empowerministry.org, and I'll be happy to send you a PDF of that book. In there, I have a hundred different lies that we can believe about ourselves and Scriptures that really contradict that, the beliefs, the Scriptures, and the beliefs that are true instead of the lies. And so when you read those verses and you read scriptures, you want to ask God for awareness. And you want to ask him, what's he saying to me? You want to ask God, what's true here, Lord? What's true about myself? What can I believe? And God will share with you. He'll share with you. And, you know, a lot of times you go, well, is it really God? And Leanne Payne says, don't be afraid of what you hear is just me. You need to know what's just me that deep, that's deep in your heart knows. And within a short time, you'll be able to discern the difference about what you already know, your wiser self, and what God might be revealing to you that's new. We need both. And both are important. And we, we need to, you know, get into the scriptures and believe the truth. We need to repent about what we're believing and, and align ourselves. When God says that he loves us from the beginning of time, we need to believe that. When he says, I've written your name on the palm of my hands, you're always in my thought. We need to know that. We need to, and when he says we're forgiven, we need to know that and believe that. And the scriptures will help us change our story. The scriptures will help us change our beliefs. When God speaks to us, when we ask God, Lord, what's the truth? And he speaks to our heart, it settles it. He's the final authority. And I encourage you to look it over, read the notes. Uh, I have another book called Power Up, and in the back of it, I have all kinds of scriptures written in the first person where you can take those things and own them for yourselves, and I encourage you to do that. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to go into the science, if you will, and some of the principles behind emotional relearning, and we're going to learn how do we really, really reconstruct what we're believing.